Right? Abbreviating. Questions you might have that we want to put on the board that can kind of inform, because we're going to use a question format today, uh, or interviewing format today. Tammy, any questions? Alternative ways to get started. Alternative ways, when you say that, what do you mean? Uh, other than getting into school for doing it, if the program is really difficult, uh, so we get a guess. Yeah. So, alternative ways to learn. Uh, to learn it or get into the industry. Okay. Alternative ways to get in. I'm going to say get in, right? Learn paths. <coughs> right? Paths. Other questions that we don't have up here that you really want to make sure the conversation is around that? How do you deal with value or net how do you do? I love how honest you are, Jeff. Because mostly, you guys, you just gotta get really good at failing. That's really what we're all about here. We make it really safe because we don't really believe in the F word, or at least not that one. We use the other one sometimes. But failure, we just call it repeated learning. You gotta get really good at not knowing and embracing the unknown, right? And learning. Everything's a learning thing. But so, how do you feel? How do you feel with the effort, the learning, or a step back? You would, I saw you put your hand up. Yeah, I, I think the funding might fall under that. Uh, how do you change the floor? How do you what? For the floor laws where they, they don't give them something on the floor. Oh, they give you like tax breaks. There you go. Okay, so like funding and tax breaks. Did you have another question? Oh. Well, you can have more than one here. There are, remember, we break every rule. We don't raise your hands, right? We want to give, you need to practice having permission here, right? To own your ideas, own your questions, and own your practice, right? It's in a safe place. Any more questions to inform the? Choosing our stories. Choosing how do you choose your stories? So choosing the right. Story, I'm sure that's going to be a conversation. Okay, we can. Um, anybody else want to add one? How do you? Do you like? I know you because you have so many questions. You come to like very curious. <laughs> How do you use mass media um, to get publicity and social media? Both media. Mass media. So how do you get publicity? Okay, one more question, and then I'm sure we'll have more. Where's a, a great place to start? Where's a great place to start? Okay. So, with that, rather... Okay, who could do a drum roll in here? Who's good at drum rolls? Thank you! Without further ado, our filmmakers, and today how we're going to do it... Charming conversation. Um, so, without further ado, I'm going to have you guys each take a couple minutes and please tell a little bit about your story, who you are. And then we'll start with questions and maybe watch a little video and get into it. Hi, folks. My name is Wilfred Bucket. Uh, I'm a filmmaker. <laughs> Uh, I thought you were just going to say hi. Uh, let's see. Uh, I've been a professional filmmaker for eight years. Um, I know I, 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 that might be confusing. I don't know what I mean exactly. But I've been making movies since I was six years old. This is all I've ever wanted to do. So it's, um, it's got to be unique fashion. But um, yeah, professionally, I just find professionally making money. Uh, and so I've been making money making movies for eight years. Um, I do a lot of documentary stuff, creative documentary work, and then I do a lot of narrative fiction stuff. 
Um, you know, I own a company here in Orlando uh, called the Bucket I had a nice name, I change it. No. Um, and then um, primarily what we do is uh, short form creative documentary for digital distribution. Um, and then, you know, uh, since before college, basically, I was doing and stuff. And stuff, and stuff, and stuff. Uh, I'm actually from Central I moved away about 10 years ago. It's like all the way to Alaska. I loved it so much. I moved there, went to college there. Fell in love with the place, and then a couple of years ago I came back to visit. And I really liked how much Central Florida could change, and I met a bunch of people who started making movies. And, and I am and I ran into him in a coffee shop, of course, mm -hmm. hanging out with another starter, Kyle Steele, right? Yeah. You were meeting with Kyle. That's right. And he invited me over, and then of course I had to invite him here because he's so cool. Right. That's what right. I hear. That's what right I hear. All right, Sherry. Hi, I'm Sherry. Thank you, Dixon. Um, I was a little concerned when I saw the topic because I'm really not a filmmaker in the same way that Woodruff is. But I think that the director of my film, Every Three Seconds, would agree that my goal is really important because I've raised a lot of money for the film and made a lot of personal connections. So um, what I can talk to you about is kind of jumping into a passion that you have from an unlikely place, because I own a commercial cleaning company that specializes in high volume restaurants and hotels, not that glamorous. So when I had an opportunity to um, work on a film that really addressed a cause that's close to my heart, ending hunger and poverty, I kind of jumped in. And I know that some of you here are entrepreneurs, and that's what this what you're about lab is about, and what I'll tell you as an entrepreneur is that it's given me the opportunity to um, have some flexibility so that I can do some things besides work at a job. My role with the cleaning company is largely administrative, and it's also given us some resources, some financial resources that, that we could put into the world in some place that um, we feel can make a difference. So. Um, that would be my role as a filmmaker. And some of those questions I can help you with, things like funding, because if you're going to make a movie, you'll have to make some money to do it. And it sounds like Woodruff has a cool arrangement that he has a business that people are buying his films. And I'm really interested to hear that. And I'm excited to show you the teaser for every few seconds, which you can see in its entirety on the whole for the Global Peace Film Festival. We're going to be on screen at the Global Peace Film Festival during the week. So I hope that you'll be interested enough to come see the full film. Okay, so couple things. You should say a little bit about what Every Three Seconds is. Okay. Introduce yourself, but tell them the film you've been um, Every Three Seconds is a documentary film about the potential of individuals to make a difference in poverty. <coughs> and um, what you'll see in the teaser is just a little glimpse of it. But essentially what, this, what the film does is follow the stories of five people who took action in an area that touched their hearts and they made a huge difference in ways that they never expected to. And the, the director of the film is Daniel Carswell. His first film is a brilliant, brilliant piece of work that still has a lot of traction called For the Bible Tells Me So about the intersection of homosexuality and Christianity. If you've seen that film, you'll know that Daniel likes to tell people stories, and that film tells the story of five families who had children come out in the context of, um, of, of Christian religion and what that meant for their families and how they dealt, dealt with it. And it, it Shoots down a lot of myths, and even though that came out in I think, 2005 or six, that still has traction. Just last week on the Huffington Post, they did a list of 12 documentaries that are changing the world, or that mind blowing documentaries, I think they called it. And the Bible tells me that was on that list. So if you get Netflix, you can stream that, watch that, and uh, that gives you a little bit of an idea also of the approach. And the total skill that Daniel Carter has in telling the story and touching people's hearts. Awesome. And we didn't pull up your site because you have some examples here. Oh, yeah. So we'll do that. Cool. And, and so that, that you guys, would you want to see their work first before we start talking? Yeah. That's pretty cool, huh? Yeah. Okay. So let's do this. Sherry, let's show yours. And then we'll show us that right there. Wood And then we'll get into the questions. That sound good? 
and we can live the life. Probably. And right. we can pray that the God that watches Sorry. over the internet is working uh -huh. right now. <laughs> 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 All right, so all you can just hit play and full screen for that one, and I'll increase the volume. Um, you might have to exit out of my anti fire computer. Good. Yeah, that thing. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, we're not technical savvy enough to have filmmakers in here. <laughs> we're a startup. Like, Ray, we're just exact, kind of happy that it looks like it might work. There are people who are starving in the world, and I drive an infinity. That's really evil. There are people who just starved to death. That's all they ever did. And meanwhile, I'm in my car, boom, 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 like having a great time, and I sleep like a baby. <laughs> I could trade my infinity for like a really good car, like a nice Ford Focus with no miles on it, and I'd get back like $20,000. And I can save hundreds of people from dying of starvation with that money. And every day I don't do it. Every day I make them die with my car. I've grown to believe that there is no greater threat to human security on this planet than our well-trained capacity to flip off our empathy switch. We are losing. Nine billion children every year. It is unacceptable that a third of the children in the developing world have brains much smaller than they're supposed to be and bodies stunted simply because they didn't get enough nutrients as a child when we know how to solve it. Not the work which is the cause of the poverty. The cause of the poverty is in the system that we created in the world. How do we end poverty and really wash it? Uh, it is actually going away in a lot of places. In China, India is going down. The real problem has been Africa. There's a, a lot of good things that could be done if we actually care to do them. No problem of human destiny is beyond human beings. Man's reason and spirit have often solved the seemingly unsolvable, and we believe they can do it again. The people who think they are not going to change are not poor and they do it all. They're ordinary people. There's a blinding potential in each of us to have an impact. The ability for each of us to be able to contribute, this is the way that it's happening now. Don't underestimate any budget. The first advice I have to bring it to the people is don't look what you're starting. Everything is about my idea. See, kids are telling us this is bad. But if you're creating, you have to create on your own. We're all in this together. I think that just becomes really clear when you're attacking a challenge. We knew that half a million mobile phones every single day were being put into desk drawers and trash cans, but those phones had value. The whole idea of somebody just sort of flying out with a suitcase of old phones and a cheap laptop, and pretty much revolutionizing the way that a rural hospital in an African country to deliver healthcare was hugely exciting, <coughs> totally amazed and inspired me as well. I am Gloria Henderson. And I am 68. I know that I do a bit of a computer. I feel like that's my calling. We want to work here. We fill up all the drugs. Not just one drop. I've been there. I know what it's like for people who don't care. <laughs> Now, lots of you have been following the story of young Charlie Simpson, who completed a sponsored bike ride to raise money for the victims of the Haiti earthquake. I remember seeing lots of children on TV, lots of them stuck, and lots of them with lots of fun on the back. So, I just think it's Or, I want to do something about it. There is an atrocity of humanity 
taking place right now in another corner of the world that most people have never heard about. I couldn't lie to myself anymore and tell myself that someday, once I've made millions of dollars, then I'll be someone who can give back. This was the moment. This was the opportunity. And these were the people who needed me. All of you are the future of Congo. <laughs> There's no reason that we should have this kind of absolute deprivation on this planet. We are way too rich and way too smart to allow this to exist. This is the moment we've come to the generation that could put an end to these terrible scourges which have afflicted humanity for so long. Now we can do it. I'm shocked that if you can carry around a bunch of minis and make some phone calls and post on Facebook and go up against some of the most powerful lobbies in this country and we won. Governments can be counted on to do the right thing, but only after they've exhausted all other possibilities. We are overwhelmed by a problem the rest of the virus is going to fall. 2,555! <laughs> 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 I can't think of a more exciting thing to do. This is showtime. <laughs> And then I've been a professional filmmaker for eight years, right. making money. And a lot of our questions were this whole thing of how do you get really in there? How do you get out there? How do you actually get the money? Talk to us a little bit about your journey into that place of making films and then making money making films. <laughs> well, uh, <laughs> filmmaking is interesting because it's sort of lumped in with the rest of creative parts. Um, but at the same time, like socially, at the same time, it sort of sits in a very well-established industry that's been around for a while now. 
Um, it's actually incredibly young compared to the rest of the, uh, more compared to like plastic arts. As far as money goes, um, you know, the only way to really make movies is to make them. Um, a lot of people, including myself, got on in some way or another by meeting with people who had a bit of a budget and were looking for somebody to fill a spot on the project. We're looking for a project to fund for a meeting so that they would be able to express a message and tell a story. Um, how do you approach that situation when you are younger? And I'm only 29, so I'm, I'm still pretty young. But, um, <laughs> you know, it is, um, will ultimately reflect on your, I guess, how you're viewed. Later on, like your attitude towards it, like some people just give it, like, no matter what, I will do what I'm, I will do what I'm told. I will do what they need. And some people are very like, I only make my movies. Wow. Uh, whereas I, um, I'm very realistic. Like I, I got started um, basically being hired on to create short form documentaries for digital distribution in Alaska for nonprofit and for um, individuals with money who are looking for a story to be told. It's like, hey, buddy, I want, I want to draw a picture, but I don't know how to draw. And I know kind of what I want the picture to be about, but like, I really like the way you draw, and I'd love you to draw this picture for me. So my attitude has always been, well, okay, so their, their approach to me with my creative, for my creative eye, my style, my attitude towards it, because I'm, I'm pretty fun-loving and very open, and I, and I try to get all like the business stuff out of the way so we can have fun of it. Um, so in a sense, I kind of call the creative shots with the projects. And so I started doing that, which is kind of ballsy, uh, at the beginning of the day. Oh, really like and I just kind of stuck with it, and they did. And so they told a friend, and that friend you know, said they were you know, made this thing to uh, you should You should check them out if you're looking to do something. And they did. And we did it, and one becomes two, becomes five. And suddenly you have sort of this racket going. Um, how to break into making money, I guess, has to do with just keeping that consistent. So um, nine times out of ten, the stuff that I do professionally, I'm approached for. Like people come to me and want to do stuff. They, they have a budget, but they have funds in mind, and they're looking to maybe line something up, and so they want to know, well, if I get this money, who's going to make it? And so I think in order to get there, you just kind of have to be realistic with yourself in terms of what you can do. So yeah, I've been making movies since I was six, but I didn't really think I was any good in terms of what I would do. I was always sort of trying to better what I was doing. So I was making a lot of movies, and I wasn't really showing them too much. Um, and I was making more movies, and ah, so many movies I'll show to a friend, or, you know, obviously my family, um, which see all the time, and they've actually been very supportive of training. Um, but eventually, uh, I started feeling comfortable in my technical abilities, with editing, with shooting, with understanding technology, and ultimately knowing when, when to ask questions. Um, a lot of other people who are obviously more technically uh, special with you, and there are always people who are more um, And, you know, I think in that regard, when you feel comfortable with the quote unquote product, I hate that, I hate the word client, but it's sure, you know, like, they're real and um, You will be able to be honest with where the money is coming from, with yourself, about, you know, you should hire me. Because why not? Why, why, why are you not the guy for the job, quote, unquote, for the lady? Why, why are you not that person? Why? Give yourself one good reason. And if you honestly want to be in this business, I'll use a term to you too. But if you want to be in filmmaking, much like any entrepreneurial business, you have to kind of put yourself up like roots and say, I am that guy. Because, 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 you know why? Because work. Because, you know, let the work speak for you. And honestly, the only way you're going to do that is to be honest with what you're going to do and what you what you like, um, and then just show it off. Mm -hmm. You know, have the balls to basically show it to people who have the money to say, "I should be that guy." And if they say no, they're fine. But at least you try it. And what have you been surprised about the journey of getting something that's good, a film that you really like, getting it out? Um, How many people want to help? And I mean, you can see, and we have Katy Perry tips on fireworks that she's given us, and she's also going to Facebook about it in seconds when it comes out. It can be released in October. So that's a 
big thing for a film like ours. It's going to help a lot. But, um, I don't know if I'd say surprise. It's, it's a jump for me to go from being a commercial community company to being in film or being a filmmaker. But who knows? This may be the only film I ever do in my whole life. I'm We'll, we'll see about that. But I guess what I would say is there's Woodruff, who's clearly a brilliant artist and has a lot of technical expertise as well as, it sounds like, some business acumen. But there are also, within any, any industry that you might be looking at, be it filmmaking or journalism or you know, some high tech thing or having a yoga shop, I don't, I don't know what anybody's interested in doing. But there are skill sets that can transfer into a lot of these different businesses. So you may or may not be the artist that Woodruff is, but perhaps you have some of my skills, which tend to be in the marketing arena, um, networking arena. And you, know, you can take those skills into an industry that you're interested in and make a difference and thrive. So um, that was kind of a surprise to me, because I never saw myself as a filmmaker or being involved, but it's been the best experience of my life. I've met a ton of people locally through the work that I'm doing, and it's, it's um, really motivated me to move on to some other projects as well, taking the same skill set. So I think I would just say that you know, if there's an industry that you're interested in, just jump in and kind of see where you might fit. And then, like Richard says, you build on it. It's free. You need more people, more people, more people. And that's been a big part of the Bible. Katie Perry saw for the Bible, tells me so, and loved it. And that was why she was going to contribute her hit song, Firework. So that's a really lucky thing. Most of you probably are never going to have access to Katy Perry, but there's somebody else that you're going to just build on and eventually that, you know, your project's going to get bigger and better and cooler. Just you know, jump in. Would you talk to us a little bit, okay, so there's this path to becoming Finding our greatness, right? You're pretty passionate about this whole idea. We talked about it at the coffee shop, yeah. right? I'd love you to share a little bit about your own philosophy about why you do things, and then also but share a little bit about your process of um, holding your art and staying with it, staying with it when you might work or maybe happy with it or. Uh, well, um, you know, I grew up. I was born in the mid '80s. Uh, 29th, and um, you know, growing up in the 80s, movies especially, remember, they were just in love with fun movies, and um, it seemed like the spectacle of imagination was so wrong that I just grew up thinking, how could you ever not want to be a part of it? And it's just so awesome, you know, and people can do this. I mean, obviously, people are just it's there right in front of me, um, physically. Uh, and so I, I, I don't know, I mean, um, to me the only way that I could become a filmmaker was when I filmed, so that's what I did. And when I started thinking about a career, the only thing that made sense was to figure out a way to make money. And this is where most people get caught up and become conflicted with the difference between art and business. And I don't want to spend too much time on the business, but honestly, this is what they never teach you in film school. They, if, if the closest they get is to say there are jobs out there for a technical you know, proficiency. If that's true, and that's that's it. You just say that. If you build it, you know, or if you have it, they'll hire you. Not true. You know, and it's not necessarily based on your talents or your skills. It's based on a multitude of things. Sometimes who they hire happens to be related to a guy they ran with one time or you know, and he gave him a call and said, Jimmy's coming to you. And that's, that's part of uh, any industry that's not inherent to film. That being said, um, making film is the only way you're only going to be able to own your skills. And so, are there any filmmakers in here? Awesome, beautiful number. Any non-filmmakers who are just interested in entrepreneurship? Love it. I love that too. We're all the same, believe it or not. Well, like some of you do it with a camera, some of you do it with um, you know, dry, dry cleaning or industrial cleaning. Some of you do it um, with selling tires. Um, but um, yeah, I think the pursuing the philosophy of, of being, and I'll speak from the perspective of someone who just wanted to be a filmmaker and that's all I want to do, um, is um, 
that you just keep doing it and refine what you want to do and just work at it. Work at it. You learn up technical. You learn technical stuff. You pick it up just because you have to because there's no way around it. Um, you learn how to network through anything. While going to public school, being part of a sports team, you learn how to network in film very much like the way you do uh, in in starting your own business because you have to make connections somewhere. And ultimately, you're trying to get money from a pot of money over here to your pocket, and you're trying to get it for no other reason than to survive to create what you have in your mind. And ideally that overflows into the next one. So a lot of, so a lot of people, there's sort of this like ladder applicant model that a lot of independent filmmakers use. We make so many films to get to a position to where financially we can invest in something big, which ideally will slingshot us out into fame and fortune. And that that sometimes works. But but saying that, um, I need to be honest with you, as you probably know as entrepreneurs who are not filmmakers, there is no right there's no one way to do it, um, but the only right way to do it is to, is to just do it regardless. And so like, I have a friend who started with the worst idea possible. He decided to make his first feature as his first movie. That took him nine years to do it. And now it is a huge success. It's been to Cannes twice. It has worldwide distribution. It's been picked up by several, several places, um, several markets, I should say. And I mean, they're, you know, they're there. Almost, that you know, but but he would never in a million years wish that on his worst enemy because it's such a pain in the ass and it's so much work and you know, am I getting off of your question? Uh -huh. Oh well. <laughs> um, but, but but the point that I'm making is that the, the way that I sort of pursue how to do it and my philosophy is to recognize what you're good at, recognize what you really want to do, and then it's just manifest destiny. You know, it's just you just you just. You get what you can when you can, and you make the opportunities. And you know why that's true? Because there's because all of human history is that. No one has ever handed anything. And if you're handed something, congratulations. But that's not a freakish thing either. Because in order to be handed something, you can be putting yourself there. So once you get past the whole slot, it's like, what do I need to do to make this happen? Um, you'll just do it. And you will have days where you're terrified, and you don't know what will happen tomorrow. You will have days where you don't even notice what's happening. And then years go by and you're like, holy shit, I can't do this. What do you do this time? Um, and um, what it does ultimately is teach you that you know, it's just kind of, it's, it's nothing special. It just is the way it works. And all filmmakers will tell you that. All filmmakers, George Lucas, Steven Spielberg, Quentin Tarantino, Guillermo del Toro, Martin Scorsese, they will all say the same thing. It's the only way that they were able to become successful just by pushing as hard as they could one direction, which was to get their movies in front of the audience. It's just a major problem. No one saw their stuff. Whatever. At least they were able to make the connections necessary to make their dreams come true. And that's all that matters to them. And suddenly they're looking back on it. Okay. We have some questions here, but I think there's been so much stuff rich dialogue. Now why don't you ask questions? Who has a question? You can ask them to come forward if you want. You know, I ask the question to you. It's your party. Come on. So if I was going to say, I want to become a filmmaker tomorrow, what are like the top three things you would say don't do? <laughs> don't make a picture tomorrow. <laughs> make short films. Uh, be realistic with your cost. If you need if you need a huge budget, you know, best of luck to you because you've never made a movie before. How are you going to convince somebody that you know, that they, they should give you um, This is the golden age of cinema. In my opinion. Don't believe me, but it's the golden age of Hollywood. Um, and it's very specific. Uh, and the 80s were a beautiful time, but now, never before, we've been so, as motion picture is so accessible. If I was born 50 years ago, I don't know what I would do. Because digital cinema has allowed, the accessibility of digital filmmaking has allowed me to realize what I always wanted to do. When I was growing up, Austin was that was ridiculous. My first my first video camera was this big. You know, I, I just, and so, you know, I mean it was ridiculous. I'm looking at this thing, how are we supposed to afford this constantly? Um, so, you know, find a camera that works for you, or the filmmaker makes the camera, no, the film. The camera doesn't. 
However, the filmmaker has a, has a mind and understanding of what was necessary to try to visually do this. It's a very effectual uh, And then ultimately, come up with a simple idea that doesn't hinge too much on one thing, especially dialogue. Dialogue is an easy way to shoot something. But as more than likely, you guys don't know Ben Kingsley, you don't know uh, Peter O'Toole, it's dead now. But if you did, you know, yeah, to deliver your rich dialogue. So instead, give yourself the benefit of the doubt. Make a movie that's more focused on environments and situations. Make, you know, an action. And um, be honest. Make a movie you want to make. Never, ever be stuck in a situation where you make a movie. Movies take a lot of work. Uh, and you're like, what am I making this movie for? Oh, I'll just get it done. Well, that works. Make a movie that you want to make all the time. Even if it's someone else's movie, make it your movie. Enjoy it. Because you're making movies. How can you explain that? <laughs> I, mean, I might be alone here, but I mean, it's awesome. Um, Three things you would not do. Oh, gosh. You want to yeah, start, you're too. just starting, you're going to be a new filmmaker. Yeah, um, <coughs> I probably wouldn't do it without some support of some people who have some technical expertise if I don't. Even if that's your best friend who knows how to work a camera and has a pretty decent camera. I wouldn't um, make a feature of the good thing. And I would and I would definitely look for a good story to tell, something that people would be interested in or something that might make a difference to people if they saw it. That's awesome. I, I can jump off on out the story thing. Well, somebody asked earlier, how do you two like I'm Dan, do you want to speak to it? How do, you, how do you pick a story and then, Rupert, I'd love you to talk a little bit about how you decide if it's the right story for you. Well, with every three seconds, as you, you met the five characters that are going to be um, kind of the stars of the film. And um, some of it's serendipity, like some of it's the media, I think, as a documentary maker or somebody that's interested in the world, they're reading. And you see the news, and of course, Charlie, the little boy, he got a lot of press because he did an extraordinary thing going out to raise this money for Haiti. His story is phenomenal and, and very hard, and yet all the stories are touching, but a lot of people really love Charlie because, yeah, who doesn't love an 80 year old boy that raises a quarter of a million dollars for you know, earthquake victims by riding his bike around them? That's a whole cool story. But um, the first story was Josh, and it was kind of a serendipitous thing because Dan was doing a fellowship at Stanford. Josh, who does the whole phones, he um, is a social entrepreneur, which might interest some of you entrepreneurs as well, because I don't think that changing the world and making money are mutually exclusive. I think some people think they're going to do terrible work or they're going to be engaged in um, <coughs> ending hunger or poverty or whatever their particular causes, that it doesn't coincide with making money. And some people think that art doesn't coincide with making money, but I think we do both, and I think we don't agree. I think it's interesting that one of the first things he considered was, this is what I want to do as a career, how can I make money at it? So I think that's really important. But um, Dan was just, he's a really lucky guy. And he went to the student fellowship at Stanford. They had a big group meeting where people were talking, and Josh came in from playing soccer. And Dan was thinking, oh, what's, who's this guy? And it turned out this guy is this really powerful kid who is basically changing how communication is happening in the world as it relates to healthcare. Because he started with the phones. He, he was in Africa. He realized that in this, in this place in Malawi, people had to walk from this little clinic probably as much as 50 or 75 miles to see somebody who was sick. Well, first, the sick person had to send a dispatch a family member. An aid worker would go to the sick person. Then they would come back to the clinic, and they would take what they needed to the sick person. If they weren't dead, they would treat them. But with texting, they cut it all in half. Well, that has expanded so much. He was first in the ground in Haiti. He was first. Um, he, he, he was consulting with the State Department about, about um, communication, and a lot is being done now with healthcare as it relates to the problems. Well, the point that I'm making in this long story is Dan was open to meeting people and finding out what they do. And even though his first impression wasn't necessarily that this is my story for the film, he got to know people and he talked to people. And I, I guess if, if, 
if what's your several writing theme is just doing the main movie, if that's what you want to do. My writing theme would be talk to as many people as you can, share with them your passion, whatever it is, if it's filmmaking or in my case it's not so much filmmaking, but it would be the story that the film is going to communicate, which I think is an important piece of filmmaking, then you know you'll get your stories because you'll either meet somebody who's your story or you'll meet somebody who knows somebody who is your story and it's keeping an open mind and open heart and and being aware of what's, what's out there. That is something Vanessa said earlier, who's also part of yeah, here as a guest. It's and it kind of goes back to Julie Cameron con um, concept for the artist that you know we like to be in our art all the time, but the world is where we get our stories. <laughs> and that being a part of the world is a part of being a storyteller, right? So talk to us a little bit about story for you. How do you get your story? How do you decide to write but it won't suck in the middle and that's what do you do? Uh well um always be willing to say no to money. Always be willing if someone approaches mm -hmm. you and you know the story idea. They just don't like it. You know, this person is probably a very nice person. Um, feels all about it. You just know it's not right for you. Be really just to say it's not interesting. There's nothing wrong with that. This isn't personal. I mean, people in, in the arts, especially, it's like it's not personal sometimes. But you should be, you should lead by example. Just be very business savvy about it. Just admit to yourself. It's like I never want to be in a situation where I'm on someone's budget with something I don't like. So tell them no. Um, as far as finding story, I totally I totally agree. I think that you know talking to people and you know be willing to like put you know get together with them. what's going on out there um, is definitely a number of, you know um, like high up in the echelons of ways to like, figure out what stories are available. To me, I just have an idea most of the time and I just go after it and meet people and usually come to something and really do it once because I go next to nothing about it. I love making news about things I don't know anything about. Give us an example. Well, I did a short film on, um, uh, a short documentary on syrup making, um, like sugar syrup. And I knew nothing about it other than it was really good on biscuits and stuff. <laughs> and so and I had heard that there was this community up in Christmas, Florida. That made sugar syrup for 200 years, the exact same plot, the same you know crop area, and in the same kettle, um, and that's just what they did. I mean, that sounds really cool. And being from Florida, I've uh, I sort of have a fascination with sort of the heritage of the state, which is typically um, a lot of the time. Uh, Florida, Alaska, um, the outreach of states. Florida is kind of a tough place historically to get to. So, you know, part of the 20th century. In most places, very, it was sort of out here. No one wanted to live here. It was hot. It was covered in mosquitoes, various diseases. They all wanted to live in Florida. Some people do. Some people <laughs> did. Some people moved here because it was so out here. And some people liked them. It was like the west of the southeast, you know. Um, there's no, I mean, it was just, you know, come out here and make your own. So these people did a long time ago. Anyway, long story short, I got there and I spent three days shooting them. And I was so fascinated with. Their, their community. There were dozens of people here eating, chatting, and telling stories. And, you know, um, and I got to learn how to make syrup just by watching, just by talking to them. Fa what fascinates me about them, this tends to be an underlying thing with a lot of my shoes and more ethnographic cases that I do, is that this culture is right on the brink of extinction. So, this particular community and other people are making syrup anyway. This is unique for this area. Um, the only people who remember how to do this, very specific process, and it takes a long time for, for them to do it, boiling, you know, harvesting, etc., are all in their early 90s and late 80s. There's only about four. Oh, wow. and, uh, and that's it. And there are people younger, 50s, 60s, you know, the kids, and their kids, and so on. And they, they're interested in helping, but they don't know the details, which means that it will never and that's just a fact. And um, that was something that I, you know, living in Alaska, Alaska's right with that stuff because the Eskimo culture, I don't want to sound like a negative Nancy, but in my observation and study, the Eskimo culture 
and, and this is the Indian, the Inupiat culture in the north, uh, on the north slope. As the Alaskan Native cultures are all dying, there's a huge effort by Native corporations and nonprofits to save it. But the reality is that the damage is done. And it comes from a multi-generational gap of language and storytelling and song that's been there for 10,000 years. It disappeared in one generation, boom, and now they can't put it back. So what you see now is the, is the huge steep and the evolution at the same time of a people that have no identity, and they've lost them. But their identity was taken from them. They're trying to remember it. They don't even know their language. Wow. So, um, to me, that's sort of the responsibility to the storytelling for the documentary thing you do is to show how can we help our fellow man. Another thing is to show, well, what are the stories that are being told? And one other responsibility is what stories will be told and disappear forever. Um, and so I find that that particularly appeals to me. Uh, so, anyway, I go with my gut. Um, <laughs> <laughs> right! Then it saturates this whole beat, right? Okay, next question. Uh, yeah. I guess for you, like when you're starting out um, with all the avenues that you have now, I mean, like Vimeo and YouTube and, you know, going to like Canada or something, like, what would be like a great way to kind of go? Kind of get yourself started. I mean, because anybody, you just start with a YouTube channel, just start putting up shorts, or should you really start putting your stuff out there for like consideration of award and anything like that? Well, there's a lot of really uh, high end um, distribution avenues out there. National Geographic is a very uh, impressive um, channel, you might say, that's on their website. National Geographic Adventure Magazine is another good one. They do actually take contributions from independent contractors. It takes a lot of work and a lot of effort to get on to that. However, um, honestly, the best way that I've seen is the old hustle. You just put it on a place that's presented well. You put it on YouTube or Vimeo, that's totally fine. However, consider it from a marketing perspective. I try to keep my website very clean and simple. We work really hard to make sure that the way that the films are presented are unabated by influence. So you can put things on YouTube, and it looks like something on YouTube. So take the time to invest in what, the, what your material is presented on. What's the platform it's on? And then get out there and push, push, push as much as you can. Business cards are not dead. Quite the contrary. Push your business cards with a very easy to remember website. And, uh, <laughs> and then, um, you know, just, just um, get people to watch it. Get people to watch it. Um, don't don't rely on Facebook. Don't rely on Twitter. That's cute that you have three or four hundred people that like it. That's lovely. What about three or four hundred thousand? How do you get that? How does that happen? You know, I mean, I'm not a I'm not a um, I'm not a, someone who has studied uh, social networking in that regard. I just push hard, and the result has been that people see my work and they like it and they're interested in participating or they're interested in getting to know me. Or they're interested in just watching it, you know. And to where ultimately my primary focus is to, you know, film festivals are great because film festivals are a bit more close to traditional how you get movies seen. Film festivals are a great way to meet other filmmakers and a good way to network. All right, the people who are going to film festivals are an amazing audience because there are people who are actually spending the money for festivals expensive to go to um, a lot of time. Um, and the time to go out and watch a whole bunch of movies. And they're willing to sit there and watch yours. So there's nothing more gratifying than walking into the theater and you're going to schedule it. And it's, it's, and it's terrifying. <laughs> and nothing, nothing to, you're not really worried, maybe, maybe you are, but you're not really worried about how they perceive the film. You're worried about the protectionist, whether he's in a good mood, and whether he is at his coffee or Drunk, and if he's drunk, as long as he does his job, I don't care. But, you know, um, you're terrified about technical glitches because you know it's waiting. And, people, and filmmakers who have been around long enough have always had an experience where you're there and the movie starts and there's a new sound. And you're like, what are you going to do? And there's like 500 people in a room and you're like, Argh. you're dying. And so immediately, even if it's not your festival, you Gone in the projection. You say, what else going on? <laughs> you know, and you just, you just, you just totally do this and say, stop, start at the beginning. You, do, you, know, you just do that because this is your shot. 
at 500 lives, every person with the right to breathe exists just like you. You're right there, and you're going to impress them in some way. Damn right that it's going to be right. And so um, just hustle. The avenues exist. They've been established for a long time. Don't rely on one specifically. Push everywhere. Push in your community, too. Because um, that's that's where you get a that's where a lot of opportunities is that we often ignore because we believe in the New York model or the LA model or the or the, or the French can novel and that's not accurate. That's a cool dive right there. Locally, if you had something, what would you take it to? And you should put a little blurb in for the global piece of the festival. But when you say that, don't ignore your community. So where would you go? Where would you go out to validate your work here? Well, um, you know, the Inzion is a cool place. Um, I don't right down the road from that, which is kind of convenient. And uh, if you weren't there last night, you missed a fine showing of War of the Worlds in the 1950s. It was badass. And uh, anyway, um, they had a film sign competition, which we actually just won the other week, which is pretty cool. Right. If you go to OK, here, so if you go to OKFilms.com, there's a short film on there called Gold, um, which I would have played. But six minutes long, and I thought I'd just show you a bit more of like kind of more of what I do professionally. But um, I don't I don't just do documentary too. I do anything I want. So I'm not a documentary filmmaker. I'm a filmmaker. I'm a storyteller. But that story is tr is based on material and a true material. It's documentary. And it's true. If the story, if it's just a fictitious narrative story, and that's what I want to make, I like it. Yeah, but, but anyway, community-wise. Um, so go see films at the Go see films at the end zone. Go to competitions. Go to film festivals. Florida is a small state in a lot of ways. Uh, and so go and see what other communities are. Tampa is Tampa has a huge film community that is very self-sustaining. Um, I don't know why, but it's there. And, and there's a lot of spotty stuff. But at the same time, you can get to know a lot of your people just going and watching the movies and walking up and asking them honest questions. Um, Oh, and this also relates to this a bit. Don't be afraid to ask questions. Any question is a good question. You know, uh, always be take the time to just ask. If you don't know, the fifth good means you have to ask another. Well, please stop us Well, right, locally we're going to be um, screening at the Golden Peace Film Festival, and although our premiere is going to be in New York in October, we do have a distributor, um, which is fantastic because most of the films don't. Get distributors, but they're going to premiere in mid October. But we're going to do a tastemaker screening at the Film Festival in September. The weekend of the 15th will be two screenings. Definitely around 5 o'clock on Sunday. I'm not sure about the other screening. We're still working on the programming. But that's a great opportunity to also see some local stuff and some international stuff because I mean, it does try to, the programmer does try to bring in um, and showcase some local film, although. Every three seconds is not very really local film. It does have a very, very strong Orlando connection because we've raised a ton of money here and we've made a lot of um, networking connections here as well that have really fostered the um, movement of the, the film moving forward. And um, I, I guess when you go to an event like that or the Florida Film Festival, I think has some local stuff as well. You just meet a lot of people who are interested in film, and inevitably some of those are going to be filmmakers. And, I just think you can always learn from networking with people in your industry of interest. Next question? Yeah. I've had a question. It's more towards, uh, I'm not a filmmaker, but um, entrepreneurs is more into those lines. What really like drives you? Uh, wake up, you know, you got to wake up at 3 o'clock in the morning and feel something that you can only film at that time. Uh, what drives you to get up? What pushes you when you don't want to do something? What gets you going when it's like, oh man, I really don't want to do this? What really clicks in your head and says, okay, this is what I need to do, or you know, what drives you your mind? <clears throat> Same thing that gets you up at 7 and you're to work. You know, it's just your responsibility. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's like anything in life. There's no magic like, password for this stuff. You have a responsibility to get something. Um, you just wake up and you do it. It's just, it's, it's drive a complete job. What I love about filmmaking, the one that I well, one thing, especially like top five things I love about, is that you're actually something you're producing, you're not consuming. This is what's this is true of all art: is that your responsibility is to produce and manifest the actual thing. Now, this is digital, but this exists. You guys just experience it. You know, um, 
it was built, it was shot, it was crafted, it took time. It'll be, you know, eventually replaced with another one we're working on right now. Um, but it doesn't matter, it exists at its own moment. For a minute and nine seconds, it has a lifespan. You know, um, it's, it's a result of, of, of um, ultimately, of need and survival. The, uh, you know, there are two types of people in the world. There are consumers and producers. Consumers are all sorts of folks, but even producers are consumers. So it's just like, consider, I guess my point is like, just consider that everyone has the drive to exist to survive. And some people have the drive to do that, and at the same time have a, have a drive to create something. And so I would align it most in my experience to just wake up in the morning and go to the office. It's the same thing, it's just what you're doing. You know, it's like, oh, I got this big report I have to do on Friday, go to school. Here's a big report to do Friday. I gotta get it finished. I got this shot, I gotta shoot at 3 a.m. I gotta go do it. It's the same thing. It's the exact same thing. It's just the same thing. How about you speak to that? Drive, motivation, tough days, how do you keep going? As an entrepreneur, not just as an executive producer on the film. Because it has to be done. You know, and if you really can't do it or don't want to do it, then I guess you have to find something to do. My husband's a better person to ask that question to because often he is up at 3 or 4 in the morning because our, we have third shift training. And I wonder how do you get the motivation? Do you think it's exactly what Woodruff says? He has a responsibility to see that the job's finished. And you know, it's a commitment that you make to your work and your life, which can be the same thing. So we see movie making as a big business, like uh, out of Hollywood, and yet movie making is also art, and we all hear stories of starving artists. Is there money to be made in the film industry outside of what we see on the big screen in Hollywood? Definitely. There's money everywhere, baby. There's, there's money everywhere. Right here, there's money. I know. Uh, no, there's... I think there's like I said, uh, Earlier, Hollywood is a very specific model. It's very specific, specific. and it and it um, there is so much more moving than people out there. Uh, if I never touch Hollywood, I will die a happy man, um, especially. But uh, you know, um, people have to make a living doing this. They have to, and, and there's re you know, and because this is their passion, they love it. Because of Hollywood and various other markets, there has been created a model. That model was reinterpreted in various different ways. You guys know a bit the difference between videography and filmmaking is? I'll tell you, because you'll, you'll save the frustration of a lot of your filmmaking out there. Videography, they go to events, they do weddings, they do funerals, they do brisses. They do all these things, um, and good for them. I'm sure there's good money. Filmmakers are storytellers. They have to make a living telling stories. Stories and art. But benefit and the grace of humanity. No! Stop on that one. <laughs> Say that again. Like, we got to capture that one. If whoever's writing this for the Launchpad, you better get that. Who's writing? For the grace of God. Okay, say that again? No, no. Well, like I said the storytelling is hard for the benefit and grace of humanity. Is we, we need it. Whether it be in film or music or whatever, or painting, you know, we, we need it. So how do you get those people who are willing to do it to survive long enough to do it? So um, yes, to answer your question, there's money to be made. There are people far wealthier than I am doing uh, less um, than I do. Um, and there are people doing more than what I do who are, you know, don't really have a pocket of this. Thing. That being said, it's, it's just, that's just business. I mean, it just depends on where you find the money, how you make it, how you anger yourself and your business happy. And sometimes it works and sometimes you starve. But what you don't do is stop. So Hollywood is not the be-all, have-all. In fact, Hollywood for the past 15 years has been on the brink of extinction. It's funny to say that, but if you actually pay attention to the, to the industrial model of this stuff, and, and maybe you have some more experience with this, um, but funding movies is huge business in and of itself. A lot of those big movies run on bank loans. You're talking about movies for three hundred million dollars. How much money that is? It's an unfathomable amount. But they 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 cost that much. They don't really, but they're made to cost that much. These models are meant to bring in a lot of people, and if they fail, huge brands have a problem. 
Disney before they bought Star Stop buying Star Wars was such a and Marvel was such a big we have to do something, a big trump card. Because if they didn't, they lost so much money and so many giant investments, they were on the brink of losing the credit. And mm -hmm. they don't have the money to do this. That can happen. <laughs> but, in, but in independent filmmaking, it can't. It can't. We can buy distribution anywhere. We can cost a fraction, not even a hair, of what it costs to make these movies. And we can still make you dance, make you sing, make you cry. You know, and people are still going to watch it. So, yes. On that note, with, um, with independent filmmaking being more content driven than mainstream being technically the visual pop, I would say, the, the movie models are going to more um, larger pictures, you know, that are, they're not putting out the small movies, you know, does that give them an opportunity to, to, to get more work out? Or, in, or do you see that as uh, affecting that side of the film? There's this point, less than 1% of all films made in a year get actual distribution. That includes Hollywood, that includes China, that includes Europe, that includes independent, um, which are non-studio, that includes Hollywood, less than 1%. Actually, it's shorts. The shorts do not distribute it. And that is about the same percentage that get PC funding. But look at how many stars go in the world. See, the model is kind of everywhere. Um, that's the fear, is that we're all trying to compete with each other. I personally just like to make the best problem that we can. But I like to make the best movie that I can and get it out there to people by dealing with one thing or another one. And then we figure out how it works for us to go through. Okay, so I want you guys now, I'm going to pose the last question because I know we're going to have, if you guys want to talk to them, you can have time. Um, so if you were talking to young entrepreneurs who are ready to change the world, change their own world, yes, 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 we are, um, Sherry, Sherry, you start and then we're going to you, um, wrap it up for us. Talk to me. Just give us your best stuff. What would you say? What would I say today? Start up and filmmakers. Um, I will tell you that being an entrepreneur is a fantastic way to have a very, very rich life. You'll work hard, but when you're successful, you'll have more flexibility. Um, I think you may have more capital, and then you can put that energy into any and that talent into any. Any cause or endeavor that interests you, and I think that um, I would encourage you to do what touches your heart, and just keep working on that, and you'll find success and fulfillment in that in that way, and um, you'll you'll find a path to you know, just live to just live a rich and exciting life. That's a big piece of it is just walking your passion and putting some effort into it. I can't say it was better than uh, yeah, just do what you want to do. Um, a lot of you guys are students, right? Just show your hands if you're a student. <laughs> um, student, but this is a very scary time where you're pulling in a lot of different directions and you're trying to satisfy the requirements of your degree. But at the same time, trying to figure out who you are. I didn't go to college or right after high school. I was against the idea because I wasn't really ready for it. It seemed expensive, and I didn't want to be like Indiana Jones, so I tried to travel a lot. Uh, and that's what I did. And, um, you know, but I went to college because I just wanted to be more rounded and wanted to learn more. You don't need to go to college to be a filmmaker. All filmmakers will tell you that. They will say, they will talk about the benefits of film school, they will talk about the benefits. No one that I've ever met or heard, maybe they're out there. I would like to believe in the logic of impossible, you know, of, of the infinite possibility of there is someone out there that says this. But you don't need to go to school to be a filmmaker. Um, you just have to, during this time, what I recommend you do is find what you really care about the most, um, what you really want to be, who you want to be. Work on, you know, and work on that. Not just your passion, but yourself. This is a lot of and um, and I used to give people to the job, but so much anymore because to be honest, there are people who actually have 
generations of people over there. So the reality is that you are now in the best time of your life to decide what path you want to take. You just go do it. And if money is the only thing that's holding you up, that is that is so frivolous and so I, I understand money makes the world go around. It's bullshit. You know, I mean money money is every money in itself is an industry. You can always get money. Where get all the money? Passion is what differentiates someone who can make their life what they want and someone who's just consuming it for the sake of the job. And when you're in your fifties, what the hell have I done? What am I? What am I? What am I doing with my life? I got. I need, I need to go buy a sports car. I can't afford. It. I need to go have sex with an eighteen-year-old girl. <laughs> so okay, okay, but maybe you could have avoided that if um, you listened to your passion. And I get a lot of people asking me, how, "How did you know? Or what do you? You know, what, what got you to follow your passion?" And I don't really have an, an answer. That I just did it. I lived a life as weird and adventurous and as normal, I guess, as anybody. But I just kept doing it, I guess, is the only difference. And in college, you changed a lot of things. I, I only stayed with one thing. I never changed my name. Because I wasn't really a journalism student. They just, I, I took some ethics classes, but I was just within the auspices of the journalism. I was really a film student. I used their cameras and their editing suites, and I did this. But I pursued my passion. So I would say decide what your passion is. And no matter how weird, you want to be an astronaut, awesome. I don't, I, you know, be creative. And it might not end up the way you think it will, but it will end up for your benefit. Because the only person who can make your life the way you want it. You know, and that's Dr. Seuss said it best. Yeah. So, go Remember, around here it's give, 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 then ask, right? These guys have been give, give, giving. So if you're new to our community, the first way to get outside of the community is to go ask one of these two to do something for you right away. Your job now is to thank them. We'll figure out how we can connect with them, figure out what else you can do for them. So that's what we ask you right now. What can we do for the two of you? How can we help you? Well, come see my movie, uh, so in September, that would be great. And you'll write some contact information on the wall for sure. us? Okay. Sure, of course I will. Um, go to the west, our website at 50seconds.net, we'd be very generous in viewing it because it's under construction, but I'd love for you to see Dan Carson's TEDx in the window about every other segment. He is a real filmmaker in a way of people book, so. Um, that's sort of cool, and he answers some of your questions as well, like how do you get your stories, and so I think that's great. And, um, you know, it's, it's such a cliche, but I guess life is on Facebook, because, you know, as the film comes out, we're going to be looking for, um, to social media to help us get the word out and get people to see it. And there are going to be so many platforms to look at it on, and that's your question about distribution. It's almost becoming, the model's almost becoming irrelevant. Because we don't see movies in the theater, most of us are seeing more movies on our computers or at our friends' house, and that's kind of the kind of making these changes. So there's lots of opportunity in that. What can we do for you? Oh, just go to okfilms.com and watch our stuff. Like us on Facebook. Enjoy it. Feel free to and you know ask me any questions. Um, honestly, you know what you can do for me too if you are in the film go make movies, show them off locally. Um, I would love to hear about what you're doing. Um, we've all come from the same places. Never be embarrassed to talk to somebody who might have more experience than you about <clears throat> what you're doing. And I know there's a lot of arrogance out there. You kind of have to set for it because occasionally there are people who I genuinely enjoy and at least give you an honest opinion about what you're doing right or wrong. Um, but at the same time, yeah, go to lkfilms.com and watch our stuff. Well, and is there a, there is a local film, are you involved with a local film making group off downtown, or is there one going on now? You know, I mean, there's a lot of like little pods from what I understand. There's ICS, have you guys heard of this? Independent Cinema Showcase. It's a show, I think it's on local public access. I don't know much about it, but I've heard about it. I saw a little flyer the museum. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and, um, to my knowledge, there is no like like big time local group of filmmakers that I've seen. That being said, go make it. 
Go Megan. Alright, so you know what we do from all that? Alright, so we have a tradition at the end of every single event. One, we clap and say you're awesome. And you're awesome. And then we stand up, go to the front, we play hits the music, and take an Instagram photo. Yeah, because so, that's what um, you do for us. That's what you do so, for us. And then you share it so um, people so know that if they want to start something, where to go. So before you guys leave, on how to build your own business, on how to do a film and get funding. We provide free coaching for all students. So afterwards, if you like coaching here for how to make a film, how to start a business, please see Shakira. And you can see me to find out about more events. I'll put you all right to the But for now, let's head to the front and take a picture. All right. All right. Yeah, take a picture. Shakira. Okay. Yeah. Okay. 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 You know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying? Come on, come in here. I will. We're about to do it. No, you can't get that cool hat. You know what I'm saying? All right, what are we playing? Ask me dance music, though. Crystal Castles. Yes. Okay. I'll just take a song. You hear that? All right. All right. What am I going to play? All right. I will. I'm trying to get Okay, start moving. This is going to work. It's going to look nice on YouTube. Come on. Is that, you guys moving? Yes? Okay, wait, no, how many? How many How many did we play? Make sure it's what? Yeah, here and, 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 and,
I have had friends that have made out, but I don't really want to just go back up to see it. Actually, when he was talking about the movie, I didn't know what he was talking about. So I guess for that, and probably you trying to right now I need to say if you don't have an idea, you can kind of help with it. Yes, all of all of you know, um, I do to do it here. I'll do it. 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 I'